Okay, hold on. Um, so, um, I guess I never really went over the final assignment. It's pretty much the same as for the term assignment. <laughs> I don't know if there's any questions about that from those few people who are here. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I guess I'll just keep talking about clean that. So, um, yeah, so I kind of rushed through at the end of last time um, some of the stuff about the different worlds thing. So I'm going to, you know, kind of pick up where I left off. So, um, right, so I guess, like, um, so as I said last time, it, you know, like, who um, sometimes sounds like he's admitting that this different world's talk is kind of figurative, right? Because, and that, that there's really something that's the same. And, you know, uh, the, the move for, for, from one world to another is, is a, a move from seeing that thing one thing, one way to seeing it another way, right? And as I pointed out last time, he, he, he introduces, I think, almost as technical terminology, the distinction between looking at and seeing to mark this out, right? Like the different, you know, they're looking at the same thing, but they're not seeing the same thing. Um, but, uh, um, so, uh, but on the other hand, he admits that he says he can't help saying it this way, but he but he also says, but there's something anomalous, <laughs> right? So like he looks he he portrays this distinction between looking at and seeing as um, as a feature of the Cartesian epistemological paradigm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, actually, towards the end of the book, he, he explicitly lists philosophy as one of the fields that doesn't have a paradigm and therefore doesn't make progress. But, um, but throughout most of the book, he talks as if what he's doing is an area that does have paradigms and you know, so I, I just, again, I don't know how to settle that. But anyway, so he says, like, um, although he can't help saying, yeah, something stays the same, they're just seeing it differently. He says that, you know, I can't quite make that work. And what's the kind of anomalous epistemological fact that, that means that he can't quite account for it? So I think this is what he says on page 118 is like a summary of it. At the very least, as a result of discovering oxygen, Lavoisier saw nature differently. So that's at the very least, he saw nature differently. But then he says, and in the absence of some recourse to that hypothetical fixed nature that he quote, saw differently, the principle of economy will urge us to say that after discovering oxygen, Lavoisier worked in a different world. Right? So, that, so he says he definitely saw nature differently. But then he asked, what did he see differently? And at this point, we would need a neutral description. Right? That is, what was he looking at that he then saw differently? We need a neutral description of the thing that he was looking at that didn't prefer what he saw before to what or what he saw afterwards. Um, uh, 
And Kuhn says, like in general, in cases of scientific revolutions, we don't have a neutral description. So, I mean, um, he, um, he presents, I guess he's thinking something like the history of logical positivism as a search for a neutral sense data language that would, you know, that would solve this problem. So you would, you know, what you would say is they both have the same sense data, but they interpret them differently. Um, and I guess that's also how what he thinks Descartes is saying. I don't think that's a super good interpretation of Descartes, actually. <laughs> um, as a history of logical positivism, it's even less good, right? Because um, it's, you know, it's not true that the alpha language is neutral between different scientific groups, for example. It's Ray Carnap never claims it's neutral between different scientific theories. On the contrary, he's using some scientific theory to decide what the basis will be. So I think, you know, I mean, Popper, I think, understands better when he accuses Carnap of being a naturalist. Um, that is, you know, um, Popper, I guess, you know, uh, like, would be unimpressed with Klein's claim to be naturalizing epistemology because he would say, look, Carnap is already a naturalist. <laughs> Because he doesn't, you know, because uh, um, he doesn't think that there's some extra scientific thing that he can talk about and he can use to uh, then like criticize science or uh, reform science or anything like that. He, he takes his basis from, from the results of science. So anyway, um, so like, um, I'm not sure exactly who this would apply to, but it, I mean, but it does apply to a strategy you can imagine someone taking at least, right? Like you say, well, look, they both, you know, their retinas are both affected in the same way. They must be seeing the same thing. Um, but, um, but again, like um, Kuhn says, we don't know how to say what that thing is in neutral terminology. Um, and as far as their retinas are both being affected the same way, they must be seeing the same thing. Well, you know, um, when I switch from seeing the duck to seeing the rabbit, my retina is still being affected the same way. <laughs> So that's like one of the things that, that this example is supposed to direct your attention to. So, uh, um, but, he's, but he also says, and this is what I was talking about at the very end last time. This example is also misleading because um, uh, because in this case there is a neutral way of describing it. right we can say what we were looking at the whole time when we saw two different things you know i mean we wouldn't get that by um, or we wouldn't need to resort to a, a neutral sense data language to say that right you just have to describe the lines and the dot that are on the black that's what we're looking at. So, um, right, as I pointed out, you know, it's not a dot and it's not a rabbit. <laughs> it's a picture. <laughs> it's a picture you can see as a picture of a dot or a picture of a rabbit. Um, but the scientific revolution, Kuhn says, is more like the example that I, I gave at the very end last time, I bring in a cage and there's an animal that's hopping around in it and you say, oh, a rabbit. 
And then I say, well, let's see, this is the D. And all of a sudden, <laughs> it's a duck, <laughs> right? And so now, yeah, what were you looking at the whole time? <laughs> you, you know, you can't say, it, right? So, uh, so Kuhn says, but now, I mean, it's a little bit like, I mean, not every scientific revolution, as Kuhn insists, a lot of scientific revolutions are pretty localized, right? So, uh, like, the practitioners don't change the way they think about anything outside their really specific field. Um, so you might think somehow that means that they would still be able to give a neutral description. But I think the point is that, like, with, you know, within that little area that's been revolutionized, whatever it is, you can't, you can't give a neutral description of the particular phenomenon that they're looking at. Um, so, um, So now, um, so that all this is kind of stuff I said last time, but then um, I want to talk a little bit about how Kuhn describes what there is in this case and there isn't in the scientific revolution case. So I, like I just said, although I didn't really explain why maybe, but I, I just said, you know, we know what this really is. <laughs> it's lines and a dot on the black. So, but that's not exactly how Kuhn says it. He says, um, well, I mean, first he says something like that. This is on page 114. Aware that nothing in his environment has changed, he directs his attention increasingly not to the figure, duck or rabbit, but to the lines on paper he is looking at. Right, so if you imagine someone, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what we're imagining here. We're imagining someone who's like surprised that there's this gestalt switch. This is the first time they've seen it, I guess, right? So, like, so like, wow, how did that happen? And then, uh, like, to figure out what's going on, they direct their attention more and more to the lines and less and less to what they're seeing. So, um, and because they're, you know, because of, he, he doesn't really explain why that's possible in this case. I mean, it obviously is possible in this case, right? But I still would like to know why Green thinks it's possible in this case, right? But, when, but anyway, it's like, because of that awareness, um, there's an, uh, external standard or external authority, he also calls it. There's an external authority they can appeal to that will tell them that they've only changed what they're seeing and not what they were looking at. Um, right, and he says the same thing about that I don't think I ever discussed this in class, but that cool like card experiment he talks about several times where, you know, they showed, so each participant only sees one card, but some of them see a regular card and some of them see cards that are the wrong color for the suit, right? So they see like a black four of hearts or whatever. And, you know, they show they show the person the card first, like very, very quickly, and then for longer and longer lengths of time, and they ask them what it is. And at first they can't tell what it is, but then, you know, as the length of time gets longer with the regular cards, they, they pretty quickly settle on the right answer. But with the anomalous cards, it takes much longer, and some people never even see. Right, like at first they, like with every card that's too short, they can't tell what it is, but then they confidently identify it as a, as a normal card. They'd be like, oh, that's a four of spades. Well, that's a four of hearts. <laughs> and then a longer exposure, they say, that's a four of spades, but there's something wrong with it. <laughs> I can't put my finger on it. And then if you show it to them long enough, eventually, 
they suddenly see, oh, it's a black four of hearts, right? But so, um, and Kuhn says in that case too, and now I guess the term, the expression external authority, it becomes clearer where it's coming in. It says like the experimenter assures them that they've been looking at the same card the whole time. Otherwise they wouldn't know. So it's like there's an authority um, and the role of a neutral sense data language would be to, to be a kind of impersonal authority at that point, I guess. Um, so, you know, the reason why am I, why am I focusing on this thing about external authority? Because now I want to come back to what Hume says at the beginning of section nine about political revolution. Um, right, so I mean, this phrase, no external authority seems to kind of allude back to that discussion of political revolutions, right? Although it's also looking forward to what he's gonna say about how science is able to handle revolutions because no external authority can tell the scientists which paradigm to accept. And there, you know, there again, he's talking about political authority, right? He explicitly mentions like appealing to the head of state or whatever. So it's against the rules to, to appeal to the head of state. So, um, so, but anyway, so what Kuhn says about political revolutions, now, I mean, so first of all, he takes it that political revolution is, so to speak, the literal case of revolution. I mean, of course, it's not really literal, right? The literal meaning of revolution is that it turns over. <laughs> Which Kuhn also makes a joke or something about when he talks about the person wearing the inverted goggles, right? He says, you know, do you remember he talks about this experiment where like you get some, you put goggles on someone so that they see everything upside down. And for a while they're, they're really disoriented because everything's upside down, but at a certain point, like their vision flips and they see everything right upside up. And Kuhn says they've experienced a revolution both literally and figuratively in their perception of war. Right, so anyway, so literally it means something, something turns over or whatever, but he's, but he's saying that the term scientific revolution is like borrowed from political revolution. I'm not sure if that's historically accurate or not. Like I think people started using revolution for both of them around the same time. I don't know. Anyway, that's, but that's maybe that's not important. So, so he says like as a way of, I guess, helping understand what he's saying about scientific revolutions, he says, like, um, think about political revolutions, and you'll see why it's appropriate to call scientific revolutions revolutions because they're similar to political revolutions. And then he says very briefly how political revolutions work. This is on page 92. So he says, political revolutions are inaugurated by a growing sense often restricted to a segment of the political community, that existing institutions have ceased adequately to meet the problems posed by an environment that they have in part created. Right, so that's what's supposed to be analogous to an anomaly. The political revolution starts because the political system um, defines certain problems as the ones that it should be able to solve. Um, and it creates the whole environment in which those problems arise that are supposed to be solvable. And yet it starts to turn out that some of those problems can't be solved. So that's the anomaly. So, um, and the important thing about this description of what causes political revolutions is that it's not because of injustice in some neutral sense. I mean, 
he's taking this for granted, right? Like, I mean, this is a, this is kind of a, uh, in some sense, radical or subversive view of how political rev what political revolutions are like. I mean, or maybe anti-subversive. Anyway, it's like, right? I mean, he's saying that that um, that you can't look at the cause of political revolution as injustice in some neutral sense, like people getting what is what is due. To use the, the definition from the Republic. Right, you, you can't so that and that and that people aren't getting what is due, and the revolution happens so that more people will get what is due to them. Rather, the revolution, um, the the crisis that eventually leads to the revolution, starts off because the political system can't solve the problems that it has set for itself. Um, and so, um, the reason the change is not reversible, the political change is not reversible, um, um, can't be expressed as by saying the new system is more just than the old one. I mean, that is, it can, but only from the point of view of the new one. <laughs> yeah. Do you like um, getting this view of the revolution from anyone in particular, or do you just like the I, I would love to know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know if he, I mean, again, he seems to take it for granted that you'll agree with this, right? Whereas, um, but it's basically like the position here basically is moral relativism, right? Like, as opposed to, you know, like the Declaration of Independence contains a kind of appeal to neutral sense data, right? It says, we hold these truths to be self evident. <laughs> That's that's like an appeal to a neutral sense data language. So Kuhn is saying, of course, we know there's nothing like that. <laughs> um, so um, so why is the change not reversible? And how does the change happen? Well, you know, um, the change happens this way, like at some point when the old political paradigm is in crisis. So, but it, I mean, but it's still, tr people are still using it to try to solve the problems because they don't have any other political system. So they have to use the one they've got to try to solve the problems. And then suddenly someone, this part seems a little bit weird, like, does it really happen that someone thinks of a new political system in the middle of the night? I don't know. But anyway, like suddenly someone comes up with an alternative political system that attracts enough people that, um, that there are now two political systems on the table. And at that point, he says, you know, like it's incommensurable. Like what the new paradigm people want to do is illegal by the standards of the old system. <laughs> Um, again, the old system is illegal or unjust by the standards of the new system. So, and there's no external authority on earth, as Locke or Hobbes would say, right? There's no external authority that they, both sides can appeal to, to judge between them. So Kuhn says, at that point, political recourse fails. <laughs> And how is the question going to be decided? Well, he says it will have to be decided by the techniques of mass persuasion, often including violence, or I guess maybe it's just often including force. Um, and then, you know, um, if the new one wins, the new one is 
going to write history, not the old one, because the old one's not around anymore. And from the point of view of the new one, it's true to say that the old system was unjust and this one's better. Um, but that's circular, as Pete would say, right? Like, um, it's not an argument that would work unless you already accepted the new system. So, I mean, um, and then Kuhn says, oh, and scientific revolution is just like that. <laughs> yeah. I guess I'm thinking like in the term, like the case of a political revolution now, oftentimes like the consequences of like the new system aren't really fully understood at the time in which the new system takes place. But it seems like maybe for scientific revolutions that would be is that like the same. I think that's part of, that's supposed to be part of what makes the analogy compelling, actually, right? Because Kuhn emphasizes that also when he talks about scientific revolutions. That at the time the new paradigm um, appears, not very many of its consequences have been worked out yet. And it still faces a lot of problems, and it's going to be very hard to get it to match reality. It does, it solves by a new standard. But it, it solves some of the problems that the old one couldn't. But it does it partly by changing the definition of what it is to solve the problem, right? But it solves some of the problems that the old one couldn't. But it also typically like undoes some of the old solutions, he says, right? So, uh, uh, even if you could settle on a neutral way of describing it, which you can't, uh, you still wouldn't be able necessarily to like um, to choose one over the other that way. And, and moreover, he says sometimes it just claims to solve the problems. Of the, right? Like in the case of Copernicus, he says that one of the anomalies, I don't know the details of this, but anyway, it has something to do with calculating the length of the calendar year, which of course is really important because Easter has to be on the right date. Right. So anyway, you know, so uh, um, so Copernicus claimed that his system was better because it would allow a more accurate calculation of the length of the calendar year. But Kuhn says actually it didn't. <laughs> so it was like it was propaganda, basically. <laughs> but yeah, so I think that's part of the parallel. The consequences are not even known yet. You have to you have to choose one or the other before. You have, you have to choose it on faith, as Kuhn says. Yeah, what was Oh, I just, I don't know if I'm understanding Kuhn right, but when he's talking about how like there's no neutral description of like why a revolution happened or why a certain political system was unjust because we're always looking at it through the lens of the new paradigm. I feel like that's, I don't want to say he's excusing like bad behavior or like he's, he's like saying, oh, we can't really say anything was objectively bad because we're always looking at it through the lens of the current system. But I think there has to be some things that we just like agree are not good. Um, and maybe that's just me, like my personal like, view, looking into this, but. Well, uh, it's not just your personal view, right? As I pointed out, like this, you know, the writers of the Declaration of Independence obviously agreed with me, right? <laughs> yeah. So, or at least they said they did. I guess that could also be better. But could we just say they don't really agree with me? They're just like appealing to my sense of like mutual justice or whatever, so they can get their ends. Or in the, in the failing political system of like British colonialism, or whatever. right? So I mean, don't really agree with you. I mean, if Kuhn wanted to say that at all, that would be at a kind of a higher level, right? I mean, you know, but yeah, I mean, because he is saying something that he knows some people he's got to know that some people disagree with. Um, although he kind of takes it for granted. Yeah. I mean, if you can agree that in science, like, you know, looking at the same thing, even, you know, when you want these two changes, you can say the same thing about political revolutions. Like, there's, you know, not everything is determined, like, by the paradigm. There's something in common between them, which is what you're looking at. Yeah, but remember, that's exactly what he says is really is problematic when we try to really understand it in the context of the scientific revolution. 
because we don't really have a neutral sense data language or whatever that we could use to describe what it is that we were both looking at. And, and you know, and it seems like he's saying the analogous thing about the political revolution. So, you know, maybe he would say, like, along with Griffin, like, I don't know exactly how to say this. I, I feel like we have to say something is really good at that, absolutely. But uh, that view really can't, like, there's anomalies. That view really doesn't fit real political change. So I don't know what to say. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, like, even like politics, you know, like, you can look at like a, a factory owner like exploiting his workers and exploiting the proletariat or like factory worker, a factory owner like providing jobs for his worker camp depends on a certain framework that they fire, you know, the uh, the activity you know, hasn't really physically changed despite our perception of it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I mean, that is at least that's how that's how Kuhn would talk about. I mean, I'm not I, I I'm not here to convert you to, right? <laughs> so, but I mean, but and in fact, I'm about to say something that uh, a little bit about how, like, how, another way you might see what's happening in this duck rabbit example. But just to, so just to finish with the thing about political revolutions, like, um, I think I said a long time ago something like. Um, the Kuhn, unlike Putnam or Popper or Carnap, like, is, I haven't been able to figure out that his politics were striking in any way. Um, but you can kind of understand if you think that this is what political revolution is about, that um, uh, you wouldn't want to get involved in that. Right, and so I mean, and, and and that's why you might instead take a kind of apolitical position that could be expressed as all power to the imagination, <laughs> right? That you know, like human institutions are just not um, getting closer to justice or truth or whatever, and so you, sh you shouldn't like try to get get too worked up about. You know, so I mean, that would all fit, except it doesn't really fit with the way Kuhn keeps, keeps implying that he's he himself is trying to establish a new paradigm. <laughs> so I don't know how to put it all together. But yeah, so like I said, I want to. This is kind of a side note because it's. Um, I mean, it's a little bit about how I would try to explain the scientific progress if I could make it work. But, you know, so like another way to see what's happening in this example is that, um, again, suppose you've never seen this Gestalt switch before. So you think that the world contains two different kinds of things, duck pictures and rabbit pictures. Um, and then you see this, you say, oh, a duck picture. And then when someone says, oh, but no, look at that as the ear, looking up, and you're like, oh. So is it a duck picture or a rabbit picture? Now, um, you may never be able to see it as anything other than a duck picture or a rabbit picture, although not both at the same time. Right, but you actually learn something about what you were looking at, namely that what you learned is that that distinction between duck picture and rabbit picture, like the world doesn't support it. Right, like you can't categorize all pictures as either duck pictures or rabbit pictures or. Well, pictures of other things. <laughs> anyway, so um, um, and the truth is that uh, right, and, and this is like this. This doesn't happen by appeal to an external authority. It's right. This is imminent critique, as they say. 
right? Like, you know, from within your own system, you learn that it has to be rejected in favor of something else that's more accurate, right? And what's, so again, like looking at it as, first I thought it was a duck and now I see it's a rabbit is not a good model for that. It's princess because it's reversible and so forth, right? But, look, but looking at the transition this way, at first I thought it either had to be a duck picture or a rabbit picture. But now I learn that that's not a good way of categorizing pictures. So that's not reversible. Um, and a lot of scientific revolutions, although maybe not all, have something like this going on in them, right? So like, you know, rather than say the difference between um, Ptolemaic astronomy and I don't know about Copernicus, but say like post-Galileo astronomy is that we used to think the center was the earth and now uh, we learn that the center is the sun. So, I mean, um, uh, I have to say before I say, well, I don't know. Anyway, like it's, I think, I guess it's common to think of it this way. But, you know, but like one of the most important things that Galileo saw was the moons of Jupiter. Why is that important? Because, like, the moons of Jupiter go around Jupiter, for sure. You could see them going around Jupiter. So, this isn't the center because the moons of Jupiter are going around this. This isn't the center either, because the moons of Jupiter are going around this. Jupiter isn't the center, because the sun and the earth aren't going around Jupiter. <laughs> so there is no center. Right? Like, that's what you learn. That the, 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 you know, like, the center of the world is, like, a, is like a key concept in Aristotelian dynamics. All motion is explained as motion towards or away from or around the center of the world, or all natural motion, right? Like, I guess you could say every really falling Aristotelian body moves either towards the center or away from the center or around the center. But, uh, um, but there is no center. Therefore, Aristotelian dynamics must be wrong. <laughs> right? And so that, and again, I'm saying that's kind of like learning that there aren't, even, you know, that you can't classify things as duck pictures or rabbit pictures. Um, and, you know, like uh, relativity has the transition from Newtonian dynamics to relativity has a lot of the same characteristics. Right, like you ask, did these two events happen at the same time? And um, uh, the answer, the new answer is, there's no such question. <laughs> Whether they happen at the same time or not depends on your reference point. Right, well, okay, if you don't know that, I don't know if I can explain it, but. <laughs> Two things are separated by if so if these if if in our reference frame these two things happen simultaneously, then that means that like life couldn't get from this one to this one before it happened, or vice versa, because it's simultaneous, right? So if for any two events like that, you can find a reference frame where this one happened later or and another reference frame where this one happened earlier. Therefore, there's no such thing as absolute simultaneity, right? Like there's no um, answer to the question about any two events that happen at different places. There's no answer to the question, which one happened first? Yeah. So like, um, what you're saying is that the progression of the paradigm 
is a kind of a degrounding of our, our notion. And therefore, we, we think the law to other frameworks, but the recognition of frameworks in itself is an act of kind of like understanding them as universal. If I say like historically, we believe this in this time, where in the modern day we believe this, I can still like a form of progress and able to determine which point uh, in time does each each parent belong to. Is that, what is that like a sort of absolutely century? We recognize the um, the lack of, of a center and like how they each correspond to a different uh, reference or each corresponds with the reference. The recognition of the reference is itself a universal thing. Uh, okay, no, so I wasn't really, this isn't supposed to be a metaphor for for a scientific revolution. This, this is an example of scientific revolution, right? So like, so, so the progress happens by destruction of our conceptual frame. Like it's a, it's a progress of, of recognition that each conceptual, that each like thing belongs to its own conceptual frame. Like I can see like, oh, it's a duck in this instance, it's a rat in this instance, but my ability to recognize in which instance it's which is a form of progress. And I can see Yeah. That, yeah. Um, right, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so like the relationship between what I'm saying and what Tune is saying is that Kuhn thinks that the, the progress has to be from one way of seeing it to another way of seeing it. And that would be like from the duck to the rabbit. And I'm saying it's like it's progress is more like between a choice between two ways of seeing it and not being able to see it either way. Yeah, and like historical, like uh like historical contextualization of each area or strength. Yeah. Anyway, I don't want to say more about this because, like, this is this is me and not him. But um, um, <clears throat> but I I didn't want to go by the back route without bringing this up. So. Is that what you meant, though, or <laughs> what? Is that what you meant? So I was saying, or is, did you mean something different? Just your whole thing. Uh, I'm not sure I understood well enough exactly what you're saying to say whether I meant the same or not. <laughs> Um, but uh, um, maybe I don't understand what I'm saying. Well <laughs> I mean, because it, you know, like, well, you know, it's, it, it's easy for me to kind of like wave my hand at these three examples, but it's, it's quite a different matter to try to. And like actually try to explain in detail what every scientific revolution is going on. You know, um, I'm never going to do the kind of stuff that Kuhn did to, to try to like, sit in archives and read all the things. So, yeah, I don't know. But anyway, um, um, but that is, I think, like. Um, and see the reason. So the reason Popper and Kuhn attacking Popper can't uh, see the answer I was kind of at least waving my hand at is that it involves the falsification of concepts. And you know from reading the exams that a lot of people still never <laughs> follow the distinction between concepts and statements, but. I mean, right? Popper said the reason Popper says concepts don't matter is because they can't be wrong. But this kind of example shows that concepts can be wrong. We can learn them wrong from experience. Um, all right. But anyway, so um, that was all stuff left over from last time, basically. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about the last part of the book. Um, I already, I guess, alluded to some of this stuff. So, uh, right, so how does the revolution end that we get back to normal science is the first thing that, that Kuhn talks about in the new rounds. The first thing he talks about is textbooks and how they distort our view of history. But yeah, I don't, I don't even know about that. You know, like, 
So it's true that textbooks usually or often, especially more elementary textbooks, will have a you know little blurb telling you, oh, so and so discovered oxygen or something like that. Um, but um, like everyone knows that's not going to be on the exam. <laughs> so I don't think anyone pays the slightest bit of attention to that. <laughs> um, but I guess he has maybe a stronger point in the sense that like the whole way the textbook is organized kind of, I don't know, is it really? The only hint it really gives of this is, is that things are named after people. Uh, or even if you've never heard of them, now you find out there was a person with this name, right? <laughs> yeah. It wasn't like the textbook doesn't really show the paradigm shifts. It kind of just shows like the accumulative, like time yeah. of what happened. So it's like, yeah. Right. But what I'm trying to get at is the textbook doesn't really directly claim anything about what happened. Right, like it, bas it, it, it basically barely talks about that, if at all. And if it does talk about that, that's not the part of people. Because, like, how, you know, how do you use a tech? How do you use a physics textbook? Basically, like, you're assigned some problems from the end of the chapter, and you then you like search through the chapter to try to figure out how to solve the problem. <laughs> if there's something on the side about how, like, you know, Lavoisier discovered oxygen or whatever. It's like, that's not going to help, right? So, um, yeah, I don't. Um, so, I mean, he says something like the way the textbook like builds up, introduces examples, builds up the theory piece by piece, kind of implies that that must be how the theory was developed. Maybe it does, but it doesn't. Again, it doesn't really say that, but. Uh, but yeah, it's true. The textbook, you know. Well, I don't know. Did I ever textbook have a textbook that said Newtonian mechanics? How did I even know it was called Newtonian mechanics? I think it just said classical mechanics. <laughs> but there's some, you know, like when you so when you learn general relativity, you're like, this is the vial tensor. So you know that I guess Vial discovered the Vial tensor. Yeah. Yes, but maybe it's like Newtonian mechanics is like a mature scientist, or not like everyone's on board with the same paradigm. The textbooks don't need to, like, <laughs> they're just asserting the facts. They're not trying to explain the difference how different paradigms progress. But I feel like, um, in some subjects, maybe like where it's more, <laughs> there's still divide in paradigm that the textbooks might like, they often, like in psychology, I think my textbooks often discuss at the beginning, usually like just the different viewpoints and how they progress. And then during the actual chapters, we'll like refer back to those and like compare them as if they're mutually comparing them, but obviously. Yeah, and I think often that type of history of psychology is really misleading in right? kind of the ways that Nick Kuhn gets it. I mean, the problem is that like that feature of the psychology textbook is, is part of the reason why Kuhn would say that it's not securely in mature science, right? I mean, even though it's, yeah, I mean, I don't know exactly what you would say about this. Because, like, I, you know, yeah, I mean, a lot of times they'll say something like, you know, Flint discovered whatever. And, you know, like, if you actually read Flint, you would see that it, he doesn't think about this at all the way we do. And it's, you know, this, right. So, I mean, kind of like the example about oil having discovered chemical elements that Kuhn discusses. But it's, yeah, he said this, but he meant, you know, like, he didn't claim he was inventing anything new and he didn't, you know, like whatever. So I don't know. Anyway, but I mean, this is supposed to be something particularly about the most mature sciences that, that distorts our view of their history. Um, and 
Yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, it's certainly in a science like that, the the message that's conveyed is that uh, you don't have to know much about this degree. That it's like it's not really very interesting, which is true in a way. I mean, the question is, what's the explanation? This comes explanation or some other confusion. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I remember just recently I was talking to a friend of mine who um, is like works in black hole astrophysics. He works on LIGO, the gravitational wave detector or whatever, and uh, I guess degree from Harvard and so on and so forth. And uh, he said something about Columbus having discovered that the world was round. And I was like, I was discovered in ancient times. <laughs> no one ever told you. <laughs> so, um, but it doesn't like hamper his ability to do black hole astrophysics, right? Like it's irrelevant who discovered it. You know. So, um, although obviously it's it's quite relevant that the world is round, right? I mean, like LIGO wouldn't work right. But, but, <laughs> Yeah, so I don't know. Anyway, um, um, so <laughs> that was all on the side because I was like, it actually first talks about that, I guess. But anyway, you know, but when Penny talks about how the revolution ends, so we have the normal science and the extraordinary science, and then there's a revolution. Now we understand, like, I mean, so as with political revolutions, when the revolution starts, it's a civil war. It's not a revolution yet. It's only a revolution when someone wins. <laughs> right. so, but anyway, there's, there's like a revolution. And, and the, if the revolutionary side wins, now, I, like, he seems to allow, although he, again, doesn't discuss any examples, but there could be times when the old paradigm wins. Um, right? And he talks about what converts scientists to the new paradigm. And a lot of it sounds pretty contingent. Yeah. How do you know when one side has won or lost in this kind of scenario? Because, I mean, it, I, I guess in science it's a little more clear cut. It's like, oh, we've changed our methods of doing things. Um, but like I don't know, it seems like it's hard to draw an actual distinction. Did the revolution has ended, or well, it might be hard to do it in the sense of like giving a explicit definition you can use. But like in the case of political revolutions, it's not really hard to tell when it's over, right? I mean, the new system is in control. Right, yeah, like, I mean, I don't have to worry that the uh, Queen of England will board soldiers in my house. <laughs> That's definitely over, right? So, I mean, uh, and I think it's similar with scientific revolutions, right? And like, at some point, the new paradigm is clearly in control. And there might still be a few, as he says, elderly holdouts. But those people are, you know, I mean, unlike in political revolutions, there, you know, there is a, um, a recourse to very much force or violence here, right? So those people are not going to be like put in prison or something. <laughs> Just like no one pays attention to their publications anymore, you know, like. And that's, yeah, so at some point it's clearly over, I think is the answer. But the question is, like, how does that happen? So, um, so like I said, I already talked about this a little bit. You know, like he, he talks about um, the type of arguments that are made on behalf of the new parents. So the type of arguments that are made on behalf of the new paradigm, he says, most often 
The strongest argument is that it solves the anomaly that led to the crisis. Now, again, it does that maybe partly by changing the rules, but um, but still, it's an argument to, for. In a way, as far as it goes, it's, it is kind of a, a rational argument, like a, like in the sense that um, it's saying to the old scientists, "Hey, you know how it's become no fun to solve puzzles under these old rules." Well, we have some new rules, <laughs> and according to these rules, that problem is that puzzle is solved. So wouldn't you like to come over these rules because maybe it'll be more fun. <laughs> we can start some puzzles, right? Like, uh, um, it's, it's, it still doesn't amount to uh, like a verification of the new paradigm versus a falsification of the old one. Although, I mean, people will refer at this point to crucial experiments. The crucial experiments often were already done a long time ago, but no one regarded them as crucial experiments then. <laughs> but now they look like crucial experiments because, again, they exhibit the fact that the new paradigm can find a solution where the old one just saw an unsolvable puzzle. So, um, uh, um, but, there's always lots of puzzles that the new paradigm can't solve. And Kuhn says it's always, I don't know if he proves this always has to be the case. He certainly says it's usually the case that at least to begin with, there'll be some um, solutions that were thought to exist, which now will turn out not to be solutions. Right, so like the example being um, um, you know, like uh, the mechanists can explain, can, can resolve the anomaly that a body remains in motion even when it's not being pushed directly anymore. Because they already have this piece of Newtonian mechanics that you know that turns that into like says no you don't you need a solution you need an explanation why it stops moving yeah um, I was thinking of this example where like a little bit after French Revolution um, <laughs> there's this guy named there was there's this debate in like French biology between like the morphologist and like the natural biologist you know. And like the natural theologist was like the dominant paradigm at the time. I don't, I don't know if that's accurate. That doesn't follow that. But like, uh, because like all the the animals and specimens were like kept in the in the single building in the natural history museum, the person who had like the dominant paradigm was able to access all the experiments. Uh, the natural theologist able to access all the experiments and therefore like use that in their argument versus the uh, non dominant paradigm was able to access the same specimens that the dominant paradigm was. Due to the fact that the other one had power in the uh, French uh, uh, Museum of Natural History. Right. Uh, so, I mean, so like that's an example of, um, and like Kuhn says that uh, mature sciences are relatively immune to this type of thing, but only relatively, right? You know, they're not completely immune. So, that's an example of someone calling on external power to help them. In, in this dispute. Um, so, um, yeah, who doesn't deny that that can happen, but he says that it happens less in mature sciences than it does in other fields. So it can't be the, the key explanation of what's going on here. Right. So, but anyway, so I was talking, I mean, I don't know if this is such a, maybe this example is a little confusing, but because I have to get into the difference between Cartesian physics and Newtonian physics, like what kind of motion is conserved or whatever. But anyway, like the mechanists can explain this one thing that has become a big problem for Aristotelian dynamics, 
I mean, again, it explains it by treating as a solution what before would have been seen as a problem. <laughs> like, you know, before the question was, why is this body still moving? Nothing's pushing it. And now the answer is, it's moving because nothing's pushing it. <laughs> right? Like, to, to get it to stop, you would have to push it. <laughs> but nevertheless, you know, by that rule change, yeah, this, this becomes uh, solvable. But at the same time, like the old theory explained all kinds of things, like magnetic attraction and, and you know, all kinds of biological processes and whatever. Um, using, uh, by its own standards, like using tech or gave things that by its own standards were solutions. Why does the magnet attract iron? You know, the magnet has an attractive power <laughs> that's specific to that type of that mixture of the elements and uh, has it has an has an affinity for iron. Iron has an affinity for it, right? It has an explanation, and now the mechanists say, "Well, that's that's not an explanation, right?" So, like at the same time as you get one new problem solved, in this case, you get like a, a ton of old problems that were solved now are not. And these people don't have a really good solution for them either, right? I mean, so that, like, if you look in the back of Descartes' Principles of Philosophy, there's a ton of pictures of things like, you know, little particles streaming out of magnets and going back in. <laughs> He's trying to explain this stuff by corpuscles pushing each other. But it's, there's, like, at a minimum, there, I guess what you can say is that at best, there's like some promise of maybe getting that to work. <laughs> Whereas the old one, can, you know, the old one, it was, it was all like solved. <laughs> so, um, right, so, so even as an argument like directed at puzzle solvers, this is a little bit like propagandistic. Like you're saying, join our new paradigm because we can solve this problem. But it's like this problem is just has perhaps arbitrarily come to seem like the most important one. Yeah. I guess that's, I mean, kind of probably you're getting at, but I'm wondering is why would you consider that to be progress? Well, so, uh, um, I mean, it's, yeah, I'm just so like that that's the last thing that Kuhn talks about in the book, right? Like progress through scientific revolutions. Um, and he says, yeah, this is a problem for my view. How I mean it was a problem, I, I pointed out it was a problem for Popper's view already, that Popper gave his answer to, but it seems like an even more severe problem for Kuhn's view. Like, how can you explain? So I mean. Even progress in normal science now actually looks a little bit hard to explain, right? But progress, progress through revolutions, it looks like the process of describing shouldn't be described as progress. So, I mean, but he, he does he does give an answer to that. And um, and at least part of it, a big part of it is that the new paradigm writes history. Right, but, but let me just finish talking about this. So, but he says, you know, sometimes the new paradigm doesn't even solve the anomalies, the anomalies of the revolution. But what happens is that in this period of extraordinary science, people start like trying all kinds of new theories. And someone hits on a paradigm that solves a bunch of other unrelated problems <laughs> that no one was really worried about or makes some surprising prediction. I mean, he discusses this case of, of Fresnel's wave theory of light 
predicting that there would be a light spot in the center, in the center, right, like in the disc. And uh, I'm not sure if that does works. I think you're shining light down on the disc in this direction. So the bottom of the disc is in shadow, but in the middle is a light spot. Just right. So, or maybe you're shining, maybe you're shining in this direction. We'll find out how this actually works. But anyway, you know, it's because of where the where the corpuscle theory would predict that right, like the center is the last place you'd expect the corpuscles to end up. But in the wave theory, it turns out that like the waves from all directions, I guess, kind of like converge on this as a maximum there. So, um, so, uh, and Fresnel didn't didn't even realize that his theory predicted that. Um, but who's the other person in the story? Poisson, I think, who was was trying to refute Fresnel's theory, like worked out, got this consequence out of it, and said, "Well, this is absurd." But then, like Fresnel said, well, let's look. And it turns out there is <laughs> So that was, you know, Kuhn says this kind of thing happens rarely, but when it happens, it's, the, it's really convincing because it clearly wasn't like deliberately built in to a new paradigm. You know, and he says that the, um, the fact that general relativity predicted the anomalous movement of the perihelion of Mercury is a similar example. So, um, so sometimes it's something like this, but other times it's just, he says that, you know, once people start working with a new paradigm, they realize that it can solve all kinds of other interesting puzzles, even though we still can't solve an anomaly puzzle, but oh well, put that aside for future research, because here's a really fun paradigm. <laughs> um, and, uh, um, Um, I got one of these pages back. It's nice to take a look at But moreover, Kuhn says, um, paradigm debates are not really about relative problem solving ability, though for good reasons they are usually couched in those terms. I, I think what he means by that is they're not really about relative problem solving ability now, or like a relative problem solving ability on an agreed upon list of problems. Right? They're, but they're about like people's kind of feeling that there's going to be some good puzzles <laughs> if we adapt the new paradigm. Um, right, so he says, this is on page 158, that ultimately the decision must be made on faith, which for Kuhn at least, so like this is not true for Popper when he talks about faith. Remember like in one of those star editions, he talks about the, like our faith and the reality of the world, things like that. Right, so he's thinking about the Kantian concept of faith, um, of practical faith. But for for Kuhn to say that it must be based on faith means it must be made without any good reason. Right? <laughs> it don't have really have a good reason for choosing one of the values. Um. So the revolution ends when enough people have, um, like the, the, the first people who do this have obviously the least good reason to do it. He says a lot of times there, it can be some like outside superstitious belief they have, or just a kind of aesthetic feeling, which again, I think Kuhn takes it for granted that aesthetics is totally subjective. So that if something is an aesthetic judgment, it's not made for any good reason. Um, so, uh, but uh, 
And then eventually, most people develop it a little bit more. They, they, they're able to exhibit more puzzle solutions. More people get attracted. Um, and yeah, eventually, everyone starts doing a new thing and they find out, oh, yeah, this is fun and they keep doing it. And then the revolution is over. Yeah. So, revolution is faith based, not progress. Well, so I haven't talked about where there's progress in that, right? But if there is progress, so I mean, um, so so Kuhn discusses first the question of whether there's progress in normal science or why normal science makes progress. Um, and he says, um, So first of all, he says there's two disciplines or types of disciplines that, that consistently make progress. And one is science, by which he means modern science, mature science, right? And the other is technology. And he says, um, this is on page 161. But we tend to confuse science and technology despite quote unquote profound differences between them because they have this characteristic of making progress in profit. So he doesn't say why technology makes progress. <laughs> Um, I mean, maybe part of his explanation of why science makes progress will apply to technology in the sense that, like, he has a kind of parallel between scientific progress and evolution by natural selection. And maybe you could say the same thing about technology, but you would have to realize that if that's the case, <clears throat> according to Kuhn at least, the selection criteria are totally different in the case of technology. Right? Like the what determines whether the new technology is accepted is, or I mean, you might think anyway. It's actually a little more complicated than that. Isn't it? You might think what determines whether the new technology will be accepted is whether it's useful. <laughs> it's more complicated than that because it, I mean there are some respects in which technological change is more like what he's saying scientific change is like, right? Like the new technology will create a whole different environment in which different things are useful, different things count as useful and useless, and it may be hard to predict that in advance what that would be like. Yeah. Uh, so, but isn't that usefulness determined by the paradigm? So, like, there's no neutral descriptor. So, something that's more more useful or more improving of our lives, or that's determined by. The well, paradigm. so I think the difference is that you know that technology is not closed to that, right? Like engineers don't get to decide what is useful and what isn't. So, even though yeah, that's relative to something. It's like an external standard from the point of view of the people developing the technology. Again, that might be a little bit of an exaggeration or it might be a little more complicated than that. Um, you know, sometimes it, like, like Apple gives us the products that they think we want <laughs> and then it turns out we do, but it like, which came first? Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, I was just saying that it may be a little more complicated than that, but for the most part, yeah. It's, it's, so the, the, neither the old technology, technological system nor the new technological system gets a say in what's the most useful thing. Although it has some effect on it, which is part of like what I was saying is made, made this more complicated. Um, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I shouldn't spend too long talking about this because I'm still sort of talking about science, but um, it's uh, uh, 
you know, Kuhn also says about technology that every civilization has technology. Whereas he says only, he qualifies this a little bit, but he says only like basically Western civilization that is defined as descended from Greece. So that would include like Arabic and Persian civilization, right? But not uh, other places. Um, that uh, that only Western civilization has produced anything more than the most rudimentary science. I mean, you know, I think uh, if you said, well, Kuhn, you know, you've defined science in a Western way, and that's why you don't find it in other places, for example, he would say, well, yeah, <laughs> but I haven't defined it that way arbitrarily. This is the thing we're interested in. Why is there this thing that happened in the 17th century that had all these really bizarre, surprising properties? That didn't happen anywhere else. So, I mean, I, I suspect with, with some qualification, which he does give, that that's probably right. Um, but in any case, whether he's right about that or not, he says about technology that it's not limited to that way. Everyone has technology, and I guess it always makes progress. So number one, he's again saying that therefore technological progress can't depend on science. Because there's always technology and there's always progress in technology, but there's usually not science. <laughs> um, and second of all, he's saying that uh, whatever the factors are that explain progress in technology, they must not be special and strange the way the factors that he says explain progress in science are. But he doesn't say more than that. Um, I mean, I guess based on his parallel, you might expect him to say that um, Politics makes progress in the same way science does. But he doesn't say that. <laughs> um, all right. Anyway, although, I mean, he does say so there's, he lists three types of discipline that don't make progress art, political theory. So maybe he's saying political theory because, as opposed to political practice. Okay. Anyway, it says art, political theory, and philosophy. <laughs> okay, so anyway, so uh, so we don't know exactly why or how he thinks technology makes progress, but he does get into the question of why and how science makes progress. And he says um, uh, he has to divide it into two parts, normal science versus well, he says normal versus extraordinary, but he means normal versus through the revolution. So, um, so his general answer in the case of normal science is resolution will, this is page 162, resolution will depend in part upon an inversion of our normal view of the relation between scientific activity and the community that practices it. We must learn to recognize as causes what have ordinarily been taken to be effects. So I think what he means by that is, so like, for example, if you asked why was uh, pre, first paradigm science divided into bickering schools that didn't agree on fundamentals and whatever. Uh, whereas the post paradigm science is all like everyone agrees and they're all doing things together. And so you would have said something like, well, you know, it's because the older people like, uh, you know, um, weren't making any scientific progress and the new people were. And he's going to say, no, you have to invert it. <laughs> right? It's like, 
it's not that they all agree with each other because they're all on the right track or something like that. It's that they can all be regarded as on the right track because they all agree with each other. <laughs> um, right, so like in discussing the, the social sciences, he says something like, you know, why is it that economists seem to uh, not have so many debates about the definition of science and whether their field is a science or not, as some of the other social sciences? Is it because they agree about what science is, or is it because they agree about economics? <laughs> and his answer is obviously is the latter. Right? So therefore, there's no reason for them to debate about fundamentals because they agree about what they what problems are worth solving and how, at least to a greater extent than people in some of the other social sciences. Right. So um, so I think like that's the overall answer, you know, um, and the details are um, of how that works. So like, first of all, he says, every school always makes progress by its own lens. And he says that that's like kind of logically necessary almost because um, when something is regarded as a creative success, this is some hint to what he means by creative and why he calls things creative fields. He says when something is re regarded as a creative success, then by definition, it's thought to add to the sum of what uh, we're trying to create, I guess. And so, um, like any field that, deter that, that determines standards for, or any school that determines standards for what counts as success is always making progress as long as it exists. Um, I'm, I'm really not so sure about this. I think historically speaking, a lot of schools have been focused on like complaining about their degeneration and how the founders were really good and weren't, you know, like we're just uh, um, increasingly don't know what we're talking about, <laughs> um, you know. And I think like from maybe like from our point of view, we can still say they're making progress because they keep producing something, and they keep saying that that was the right kind of thing to produce. And so we say, oh, so they should say they're making progress. But they say these things we're producing are getting worse and worse. And the things we're producing are aimed at trying to understand the original good things. But we're getting worse and worse at doing that. <laughs> right. So I don't know. Anyway, but he says every school makes progress by its own lights. I guess another question about this would be how this applies to the case of modern art that he also brings up. So shouldn't we say that? Maybe he doesn't think artistic schools make progress by their own lights, like abstract expressionism makes progress by their own lights or something. I'm not sure how it's supposed to apply. But in any case, so what he says is every school always makes progress by its own lights. Um, the reason normal science makes, as a whole, makes progress, whereas the pre paradigm science didn't, is because now there's only one school. So again, it's like an inversion. You might have thought now there's only one school because now we know what the right way to do this is. But if you say it's the other way around, now we all agree what the right way to do this is because all the other schools have been uh, extinguished. <laughs> um, and uh, um, Another part of the answer is, which I already alluded to, is the insulated nature of normal science. Right? So, again, like you might think um, that normal science, it, you might think that science is insulated from outside interference because scientists really know what they're talking about and other people shouldn't put in. Whereas, let's say philosophy shouldn't be 
insulated from outside interference because philosophers don't really know what they're talking about and help from outside is to be appreciated right so you know so like um but but Kuhn is saying it's the other way around like scientists quote unquote really know what they're talking about because they alone get to decide like what counts as knowing what you're talking about so um and why is that like so i mean why is normal science able to do that so i think like from one point of view the answer is going to be contingent historical circumstances and that's why it almost never happens <laughs> right like that that would be part of Kuhn's explanation but from another point of view, I think like a kind of logical point of view, you can say, well, like puzzle solving is always like that as long as it exists, <laughs> right? Like you can't have puzzle solving unless the people who uh, are engaged in the puzzle solving are allowed to determine for themselves what their rules are. Um, someone else is going to come in and say, no, I don't like that solution, and I don't care about your rules, then they're not going to be able to carry on that activity. So, right, so that's the way of saying that, like, if there is an activity of the kind that Kuhn calls normal science, it will be insulated in this way. Um, and another thing that he says makes for progress in normal science is um, ignorance of history, <laughs> right? He says like in art and music and to some extent in philosophy and social science, um, people are educated by being like exposed to previous versions of the field or classics or whatever. So, um, um, so they constantly have in front of them the possibility of alternate choices of what the right problems to solve are, what the, you know. Uh, so normal science, and again, this is like a necessary feature of a puzzle solving activity. You know, like you can't, um, if everyone's gonna try to solve a certain kind of puzzle, you can't have them all worrying about whether these are the right rules or not. <laughs> I mean, they can worry about it in their spare time if they want. And some scientists do get interested in the history of science, right? But it can't be part of learning how, or, or like a part of the activity of learning how to solve a puzzle or solving a puzzle to, to keep thinking, maybe this would be better if we allowed this instead. <laughs> yeah. It's like better what we thought Oh, from like the inside so philosophical education, <laughs> where he says um, <laughs> to like think about obey the rules to not obey a rule even. So in this sense, like scientists obey the rule, they grasp it, but they think about it and if they think about it too much, then you're outside the activity again. And to do science and really to grasp this like set of rules that like is, isn't really explicated well and just to do it kind of. Yeah, so, and I think, you know, if you were to ask, like, what's really the difference between, say, physics and sociology, um, the rules, the rules that physicists follow are not an interesting object of physics, right? I mean, you could give a physical explanation of why physicists do what they do. Right, just like Socrates talks about someone explaining why I'm sitting here by saying, Oh, the ligaments are attached to that, you know, whatever. Right. So, uh, but it wouldn't, but, um, but that wouldn't be a physically interesting problem. Right. Like physics is not an interesting object of physics. Whereas sociology obviously could be a really interesting object for sociology. <laughs> Right. So you have to, so like, the, I mean, this is, this is different from the answer Kuhn's given, right? So I mean, again, I'm kind of like editorializing all of it. But so getting back to Kuhn anyway, um, 
So like, so again, like you might think, why is it that scientists don't bother reading the history of their field? Because they all really know what they're doing. And you know, it doesn't matter what, you know, exactly how Newton said it or whatever. And let alone people who said things that are like the, what someone said about phlogiston or whatever, right? Like, you know, the coon is saying, no, it's the other way around. It's because they're allowed to ignore that stuff that they're able to make progress by their own lights. Now he says this, this type of thing is only part of the explanation. Part of the explanation is also just that, well, I mean, I guess, no, I guess this is supposed to also be an effect of these same things. Given the, 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 the absence of outside interference, the um, fact that you don't need to worry about the fundamental principles because there's no other schools to argue with, and you don't know anything about the history of the field, given all that, you're, you're able to concentrate completely on the very problems that the paradigm assures you will be solvable. And just work on those, you know. And so, like, as long as this keeps going, um, that means you're going to make really, really fast progress. But it's progress in what? It's progress in solving the puzzles that the paradigm says are worth solving. It's precisely because, for example, it's not progress in solving the puzzles that would be useful to solve. Um, that, right, that the insulation from outside interference is what protects you against that, for example. Right, so again, Kuhn says, as opposed to in sociology, you know, people are going to say, look, we have this really big problem with like racial discrimination or whatever. You have to work on that. Don't work on whatever random puzzle is you find interesting. Work on what we need you to work on. And he's saying that like the insulation of mature science prevents that. So it allows you to make progress in part precisely by not requiring you to make progress in anything useful. Um, okay, so that's more or less the explanation of progress in normal science. Then the question, what is, what about progress in revolutions? And, um, So, uh, so part of the answer is, um, and Kuhn actually uses, this is on page 165, uses the, the, the word Orwellian. <laughs> right? So like part of the answer is that in the aftermath of the revolution, they're going to change all the textbooks. Um, and there will be no trace of the standards by which the old paradigm might have seemed better than the new paradigm. All that's left are the standards of the new paradigm by which the new paradigm is obviously better. <laughs> um, of course, political revolutions don't always accomplish that. Although maybe they get more or less close to it, depending on which you're thinking about. But, um, but uh, maybe that's why, in the case of many political revolutions, no, that's right. It make that work. In any case, so he's, so so that's part of the answer. But it's like by. It's the people who come after this have to see this as progress. Um, now, I mean, he also adds something else, which, which I think is supposed to kind of mitigate this, but it's a little bit.
So it's like this. So the, the new paradigm will always be uh, chosen because it seems that, or it seemed to be promising of solving more puzzles or solving puzzles with a higher precision. I don't know if that really makes, you don't solve a puzzle with precision, but anyway. Yeah, it seems like it's based on consensus as well. Like consensus plays a, a role in defining what is progress uh, because the revolution, the revolutionary science wouldn't be adopted without consensus. So I feel like that's important. Yeah, well, I mean, he's like, he def I guess he offers as a kind of defense against the grimmest possible reading of this to say, look, the authority that does this is just the scientific community as a whole, right? It's not someone else coming in. That's part of the definition of like what makes it normal science. Um, but, but you still might ask, is what they're doing at that point rational? Like, is that what a rational being would do, <laughs> given their evidence? Or would a rational being become a movie comedian or something instead? Right? I mean, that's that's like I think that's the real question that this book is raising about science. It's saying that yes, modern science does, by some definition, make enormous progress. But when you look into what that consists in and why, um, it, be it becomes increasingly unclear whether that's progress that you should want. <laughs> right? I mean, not in the sense that it leads to something bad. Right, like he's not warning that, that like science will make things worse and worse or something like that. Maybe technology you might worry about, it, right? But he's separating science from technology. So, but it's just a question of whether, like, it's and you know what, like it's not. Uh, I think one reason he underplays this. And then later, if you read the 1969 proscript, he even he seems to like really distance himself from it. But one reason I think he underplays this is because, like, he's not going to proposedly do away with the institution of science. Why not? Well, that would basically be a political revolution, <laughs> right? And like free the scientists from their irrational, right? And like. Like he doesn't, based on what he says about political revolutions, he doesn't think that can work. <laughs> so, but if you're an individual and you're reading this book, you know, and you're trying to decide what to do, it seems, even though he, like, whatever he says to deny it later, it seems really clear that he's raising at least a strong question in your mind. Why am I doing this? Shouldn't I do something else? Yeah. <laughs> Science because medicine is clearly like something useful, like you know, the demand of certain people, but it's also like, it's like reliance on technology, right? That's quite a lot. I think he tried, I think he tried to classify medicine as technology, yes, okay. or at least you know, I mean, maybe there's some people who are working in a medical school or a medical institution or whatever, who are really biochemists and they're really scientists. But like medicine as a discipline, I think he classifies as, te as technology. Oh, I guess I meant to say like, if it's a technology, then it could be the lab of science. Oh. Like earlier, he said technology not clinically. Well, I mean, that's like, remember, I already raised that question about like, uh, oh, and I see I've gone way over the time actually, but, so, I, I mean, I already raised that question about like physics and, you know, could we make this computer work for physics? And I don't understand it in the answer But anyway, I'm out of time. So, everyone have a good break. And uh, thank you for those of you who are here for continuing to come around. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.